And, and David, I will stop sharing my screen so that you can take uh, control. So we'll turn it back to you. Okay. You should all be seeing my screen now. Yes, we can see it. Okay, so um, right now I'm going to give. Uh, we're we're pretty early, you know. We're less than a month into the program year, so um, I don't have a lot of data on or a lot to talk about this program year. I've got a couple slides just to go over, but uh, the thing I want to talk about more generally is. Uh, energy affordability and um, there, there's no proposal here. This are just some of my thoughts on uh, where we're at uh, as a state and um, kind of an aspirational goal of where might we try to go. So um, talking about the 24 uh, year, the three, three and a half weeks into the program year, where are we at? So these are uh, cumulative um, applications taken during the first uh, be, before the first of November. Uh, the light blue line is pre-COVID, and then this dark blue line is last year. So last year we started taking at the beginning of September. Uh, previous to COVID, we always started October first. Uh, so um, you know you can see the the kind of the slope of the two lines is pretty well. They look like they're going up parallel. So we started earlier last year, but the rate that we took uh, applications really wasn't that different. It just last year it stayed. Uh, normally this kind of tails off, so the line gets less steep, uh, kind of flattens out as you go on to the uh, the rest of the program year. And last year it kind of it stayed going up at that rate for a longer period of time. So what does this year look like? Uh, this is uh, in orange here is this program year. Uh, like this is through today, so this has a couple more days than the one that we sent out to you. Uh, but we're at 72,000 right now. So um, earlier in Leslie Ann's presentation, she said that we're 45% higher. That's through like 25 days of taking application. Uh, so um, this, the orange line here is steeper than even than either pre-COVID or last year. So we are taking applications faster than we have in the past. Uh, we're doing several, uh, I think, I don't know, six or seven days uh, thus far this year. We've had over 4,000 applications taken in, a, taken in a single day, and that's higher than uh, we've seen in past years. Uh, the thing that we are going to be watching is how long do we stay at this high level? Will this continue on for you know five, six weeks, or will we start to trail off like we have in previous years? I think uh, because we've opened up the priority period to all priority groups um, that uh, maybe we're just seeing more applications because of that, uh, but we'll we'll have to uh, watch and see uh, how we end up. Uh, but this is what it's looking like now. We're taking faster than uh, than we have in the past. So I'm going to move to energy affordability now. And uh, so something that uh, I think comments that I've heard uh, over the last couple of years with our the way we've handled PIP is uh, that uh, folks are worried that we're, uh, I don't know, we're, we're not as concerned about PIP as what some other, you know, I know there are some utilities that have asked us about it quite a bit, and then I know poverty advocates have asked. And all of this, uh, the PIP program is tied to the, the uh, concept of 6% uh, energy burden for a household. Uh, and we try to get uh, every PIP household to that 6%, whereas LIHEAP, uh, we designed the matrix just to try to not run out of money uh, for the people that uh, we serve. So I just wanna start by saying like PIP, I think PIP is a great program, but I want everyone in the state to have that same benefit. I, I think regardless of where we end up percentage wise, I think that uh, having all, uh, all of our clients uh, have the similar level of assistance is important. And ideally it would be that 6% as the goal of PIP is. So 
why can't we do that? Where, where are we at? How does this work? So this is a, a slide that you've seen before. This is from the July meeting. A couple things that I want to point out here. Um, the projection forward in years, uh, this assumes status quo with us triggering the meter rate increase uh, three times to double our funding over the next three years. So that's why after we step down from uh, the high funding from COVID, uh, we get down to a base level that's above what we were pre-COVID because of that, uh, the trigger uh, and the doubling of the charge over uh, the next three years. But um, the thing that I'm going to look at here over the next slides, I'm, I'm going to compare program year 22 to that goal of 6%. And in 22, we had $406 million that we issued in client benefits. That's the highest, uh, I believe, that we've ever done. I don't know back years ago, but uh, in recent years, that's by far the highest that we've ever done. This year, we have available to us $280 million, uh, depending on any, it, that's the status quo assumption of what we think we're going to have. Something unusual would have to happen, like a, the federal government doing something or something like that. So our assumption is $280 million. So uh, those two numbers are numbers to keep in mind as we look to the uh, the um, the next slides. Before I move to that, I do want to point out uh, Owen from Rockford asked about uh, clients and how to it handle uh, upset clients with the benefit levels going down. This shows why they go down. Last year for LIHEAP, we had $313 million available to issue as client benefits. This year we have 237. So that's a decrease, that's a 24% decrease. So our average benefits, uh, I'll go to the next, uh, this slide, and um, the average benefit for LIHEAP household this year is uh, going to be around $760. Last year it was over 1,000, but a 24% decrease from 1,000 leaves you at around $760. So, uh, you know, the, the bottom line is we only, we don't, sit on a money tree here at DCEO, we can only issue as much as we have available. And the reality is that we have 76%, uh, you know, 76 cents for every dollar that we gave out last year. Um, this slide here is pretty basic, but I used it for another uh, presentation with folks who aren't as uh, um, well acquainted with our programs. But uh, the thing that I wanna show here is LIHEAP is $760 this year and PIP as uh, Maria said in her presentation is $1,283. Uh, so the average LIHEAP client uh, is getting $523 less per household than our PIP client. So they're getting, uh, uh, the PIP client is getting 69% more than the average LIHEAP client. So that's what I'm talking about with uh, why we're handling PIP the way we are. For any PIP client that we add, we're really like missing, we're, we're, we're unable to serve uh, over one and a half households uh, with LIHEAP. So um, that's what we can do with the funding that we have available this year. Something that uh, Maria put in the chat is that with the reduction of 24% on our LIHEAP side, the way we did that with the benefit matrix was that we kept the zero 50% uh, the same as last year and we did the reductions in the bottom three uh, poverty levels that we serve. I think it's on, yeah, it's on the next slide here. Um, this, once again, uh, this is the 2022 year, uh, which um, we don't have the, the data for 2023 that will come with the performance measures data that we'll get in November from the utilities. But we kept the, uh, the benefit matrix was the same in 23, uh, as it was in 22, so these numbers would be similar. Uh, but when you look at the uh, zero to 50 percent federal poverty level, uh, our ben our average benefit in 22 and 23, and it should be similar this year because we didn't change that bin. Uh, they got uh, $1,636. The household in that bin start off with a an energy burden of 58 percent. So remember, we're, we're shooting for 6%. They start with 58%. Even after we gave the benefit of uh, 1636, they still ended with 16% uh, 
of uh, energy burden. You look at the uh, other three bins, we actually, in 2022, when we had the highest funding ever, we had uh, enough uh, funding to keep those, uh, those uh, households and those uh, poverty levels at 6% or better after the fly heap uh, was given to them. So in that year where we had 406 million, we were able to, for uh, many of our households, able to get them to 6%. Uh, but uh, unable to keep the, the zero to 50%. So when we made the decision this year with having less funding, this, uh, this table right here explains why we made the adjustments to the bottom three bins and not the zero to 50%. Uh, and we don't have data yet to know exactly uh, where we ended up with the 2023, but that's something we'll be calculating as soon as we get it so we can see uh, where we left the other the other bins, um, but once again in 2023 it should look quite a bit like this uh, because we kept the benefit matrix the same into 23. It'll be 24 where we'll see uh, what the impact was on on those households. So this is a table that shows uh, that data in the last slide. Uh, the percentage of federal poverty level uh, is on the uh, horizontal axis here on the X axis. So it goes from 0% federal poverty up to 200%. And then on the uh, Y axis, on the vertical here, you have the energy burden that that household is experiencing. The dark blue line is prior to our assistance. What was the average energy burden for households in that poverty percentage? So you can see down here at 200% uh, federal poverty, uh, there they're uh, under 10% energy burden. This red line right here, that's at 6%. So this is the goal that we're shooting for uh, in PIP. And you know, ideally, this is an affordable, uh, it's actually considered a moderate uh, energy burden. Anything over that is considered high. So this line 6% or this red line that's 6% is what we would like to get people to. So you can see out here at 200% federal poverty, they actually start uh, at the 6% level. Uh, but with the green line, that shows where we leave the households after they receive our benefits. And in 22, when with that high funding level, we, will, we were able to keep a lot of our uh, households, the, the average household up to around 80% federal poverty level was actually left at a with an energy burden that was less than 6%. But you can see as we go here towards the 0% uh, uh, federal poverty, so the zero income people, you can see that the energy burden shoots way up because it, it's the uh, utility cost divided by the income. And as the income goes to zero, that makes the, uh, the energy burden go way up. So this group is the group that we were unable to serve. The next slide here, I zoom in on the zero to 50%. So this is the group that we left with an energy burden above that 6%. And this right here in red is the shortfall that we had uh, to be able to keep households at a 6% energy burden. So in that year where we had that funding, how much more would it have taken uh, to uh, keep people? This here in red is the amount. So. Um, Here's the, the aspirational question, as I call it. What would it take for us as a state to be able to keep all of our energy assistance clients at a 6% energy burden? And the performance measures data that we receive from the util utilities, uh, it's great information and it enables us to actually uh, you know, zoom in and see exactly, we, we know what households are making from the questions that we ask during intake. And now when we get this data from the utilities, we actually know what household by household, what they're paying for their utilities. And after we go through all the data and clean everything up, we end up with uh, 150,000 households. So um, almost half of our households, we end up knowing exactly what their utility bills are along with all the information we collect. So here's what, uh, here's what the data shows. 
for our 350,000 LIHEAP and PIP clients. And this is for an, an average year here, the data that I'm showing. Uh, so uh, the increase in funding that we got uh, over the in, in the COVID years, that's not going to be shown here. This would be going forward. What would we be looking at? Um, and the uh, the utility costs are from the program year 22. So this may not have it, it may be a little more now, uh, but this was program year 22. The average utility cost per household was around two thousand dollars. We have uh, 350,000 households roughly that we served uh, last year in 23. So if you have $2,000 per household and 350,000 households, that's $700 million in total utility costs that our LIHEAP and PIP clients are uh, have to pay uh, over the year. We know what the income of our clients are. Uh, you know, by household by household, we know what their income is. Uh, that's part of how we determine what their uh, benefit level is. And we know that those 350,000 households have around $5.4 billion in income. And if you take 6% of that, which is the, that's the amount that we're trying to aim for, for a household to be able to pay and have an affordable bill. 6% uh, of 5.4 billion is 325 million. So they have 700 million in utility bills, and we're saying to have a moderate uh, energy burden, they have available 325 million to pay to, for their utilities. So that leaves the gap of uh, these here in green of 375 million. So we need 375 million to be able to keep everyone at 6% energy burden. I said uh, in 22, we had 406 million available to us. So in 22, we actually had enough funding that we could have kept all of our clients at 6% energy burden. Now, we didn't because our benefit matrix was designed that we gave uh, um, we gave benefits to clients that were already near 6%, and we brought clients below 6%. I think the, the 150 to 200 ended up with a 4% energy burden. So we could have, in those years, adjusted the uh, the benefit matrix and given more money to the zero to 50 and less at the top end, and we could have met it. I think that I'd have to go back and look, but that's the only year, uh, maybe in 23, we also had enough. But this year, we know that we have $280 million available to us. Uh, so if you add 280 to the 325 million, you do fall short of the 700 million. So this year, we're going to be leaving a much larger portion of our clientele uh, with an energy burden that's greater than 6%. Um, so let's look in a normal year, uh, what, uh, what are we uh, lacking to be able to keep people at a 6%? So the households are paying 325 million. We annually get uh, from the federal government and client benefits uh, for LIHEAP around $120 million. So our total HHS LIHEAP award is 175 in that area. And then when you take off weatherization and the administration at the state and the local levels, you end up with around 120 million of uh, benefits from the federal government. Right now, uh, the state fund uh, has around 70 million available in client benefits. We collect around 100 million and then the same uh, weatherization and admin comes off, then you end up with around 70 million. And that's funded by the 48 cent a month meter charge. So you have those two. In normal years, we have uh, 190 million to add on to the 325. So that historically has been the gap that we're left with. Now, over the next few years, if nothing else happens and we get the, uh, the three triggers and it doubles the state fund, then we'll have 140 million there. So then we'll have 260 million, uh, and 260 million is still short of the 375 million that uh, we need to uh, to make up the, the difference here in green. The thing that this tells me is that we're getting close. We're we're not like uh, immensely far away. It's something that is doable. We actually in in program year 22, we had the funding. So this is something that's possible. 
but it would take uh, you know some action and some uh, revenue increases to be able to do. So the 185 shortfall uh, is what we have to keep clients at 6%. Now, there's several things to think about as we look at this. Uh, the first thing I would say is that in CJA, there are discount rates that are going to lower the bills for our clients, and that's going to reduce the, the 700 million. So if that goes in uh, place and we start receiving the information from the utilities that shows what the reduction in the actual payments of our clients uh, are, that will re reduce this 85 million, 185 million. So there's a lot of different ways that you could get to uh, this 6%. But this just kind of this is meant to show the the magnitude of uh, how far we're uh, away from that. Um, the last thing I'll say is that this is a kind of a uh, a typical year, and what happens uh, if numbers change? So uh, I've done. I'm not going to show here, but I've played around a little bit with what I would call a sensitivity analysis that changes that. Uh, makes a couple of assumptions and sees what a change in this, how that affects that. So what would change to make these numbers different? First, if utility bills go up, how does that change this? Well, if utility bills go up on average 25%, that 700 million is going to be whatever 25% times 700. It'd be like, uh, you know, 850 million. And all of a sudden we're going to need 150 million more uh, because of the utility cost increase. The second thing that could change is the number of people that come in. Uh, if people start to hear that there's a greater benefit, perhaps more people will come in or just naturally more people uh, you know, with growth come in, that will change it as well. So those types of things, um, if we set a, a static rate, like we just double the meter charge and we get close, as those things change, it would affect our ability to keep people at 6%. So, um, how it's designed, uh, if, there's, if there's any change in, in the way that we do this, uh, those types of things are things that need to be thought about as we uh, make decisions on how to uh, um, react to the um, trying to get to the 6%. So uh, that's my last slide, uh, and I haven't been watching the chat, so are there any questions? There's one uh, question from Abigail about the. Uh, uh, she's asking whether the 350,000 is the current uh, customer base. Last year, um, I don't have the numbers right at my fingertips, but last year we ended up, I think, with around 342,000 uh, if you take LIHEAP and PIP. Uh, so this is a little bit above uh, what we served last year, but. In the in the ballpark. Any other questions? Okay. Um, with that, uh, if there are no questions for that part of the presentation, we'll move on to the next item in other business. And that is the uh, PAC members designee letter. Uh, Maria, do you want to talk about uh, that? Yes, uh, uh, thank you, David. So, um, just to remind everyone, the current uh, PAC uh, membership will expire December 31st of this year. So, um, pretty soon we're going to be sending um, you and your organization the new letter asking you to uh, for your organization to uh, confirm your uh, PAC membership or um, uh, des uh, des uh, designate another uh, person. So we'll be reaching out via email uh, in the next couple of weeks. So uh, we just wanted to um, you know, give you a heads up and then the new letters will be um, the new membership will last for, for two years after that as well. So uh, please look up for the for the for the email soon. And that's it, David. David, we cannot hear you. I think you're on mute. 
I'm sorry, I was just saying that I don't have the uh, agenda up. So I think the next item is to talk about the um, meeting schedule for next year. Maria. Sorry about that. I was just talking to. <laughs> so uh, I was saying sorry that uh, I wasn't showing the agenda. So yeah, the next. Um, so the next meeting will be scheduled in January, and typically during the month of December, we will issue the annual meeting schedule. And uh, you know, at that time, we will be emailing you the schedule as well as posting it in our um, Life website. So. Um, be on the lookout for for that um, email as well with the new uh, meeting schedule. Yeah, and uh, Maria, we didn't talk about this, but I I think I want to ask it now. Um, as we're scheduling the meetings for next year, uh, the PIP, you know, we have historically done the PIP subcommittee meeting two weeks before the PAC meeting. This year we or this meeting. Uh, we combined it into one and uh, you and I have, I don't, if we've talked about this explicitly, I don't remember, but uh, going into next year, are we, uh, I think it would make sense for us to continue doing that unless there's kind of a, uh, a loud outcry from this group that they think we need both. Hey, it's yeah. Lesan, and I will say, um, I'll say we have historically been doing it when there was a lot going on with PIP and we were developing PIP and, but, you know, we've been very much status quo or keeping, keeping everyone informed. And I personally vote for combining the meetings and Eric says he's okay with it. So, you know, it was only, it's only historical in the sense that it was very necessary to have those separately, but I think maybe for the last couple of years, we haven't really needed to have them separately. Okay. So I, I think we'll, yeah, I think so as well. I think we'll, we'll uh, continue moving down this route. And if, uh, you know, we have the ability to change it even mid year, we can, we can make an adjustment, but I think our, uh, the way we'll send it out now will be with one meeting, uh, you know, at the, the fourth Thursday, one meeting. Uh, and see if uh, if anyone else. I, I see people chiming in, so uh, thank you all, and we'll we'll proceed that way. So that being said, I think we've reached the end of the meeting. Um, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, as always, if you have any questions or want to, you know, just chat, let us know. Other than that, uh, this meeting is adjourned, and we will talk to you. Uh, if not before, uh, we'll talk to you next year. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.